This is a tutorial to set up two Kubernetes nodes. We're going to create a cluster with a master and a slave using the tutorial on my blog, which is for Kubernetes on bare metal. Now, as long as you have Ubuntu available, it doesn't matter whether you're using a VM or a, um, an actual machine here. So I've got two shell sessions here. The first one is called Fastnet is master. And if we look at OS release, we can see that we're on the LTS version of Ubuntu, which is perfect for this blog. So we can skip down to the first part of the prereqs and we need to update our app repositories. So I'm going to do that on both machines. This is installing quite an old version of Docker, actually 12.6, but that's absolutely okay. Kubernetes tends to work better with older versions of Docker. Now we can go ahead and add the apt repos for Kubernetes project. And this is the second host. What we'll now do is start to um, populate the list file for apt. And we can now do an update and install Kubernetes tools. Now the host that I'm using here is using root. So we don't need to be typing in sudo behind all our commands that might vary on the VM that you're on. And let's repeat that on the first node. So we now have the slave up and running and we're starting to look at the point now where we would initialize a cluster with kubeadm. So we can leave the slave machine for now. Now I haven't initialized um, a cluster on this particular provider before, this is Sivo. And when I wrote this blog originally, I told you to skip the pre-flight checks. And the reason for that was that we didn't have the kernel information saved on the machine. So what I'm gonna to try to do is the same again, but I'm going to try to see whether it will work, whether we have that kernel information. I just want to check the IP address that I have available here which I need for the, the next command. And part of this command is also gonna set up Kubernetes 1.6. So the other, the other option is obviously 1.7, which is a bit newer. So let's see whether this works without the pre-flight check. So we want that control plane to become ready for the API, and then we'll start to see 
the RBAC rules getting applied and the add-ons being installed. Great, so now we have the um, a code block here, which it tells us to run as a regular user. The reason we do this is because we don't want to be administrating a cluster as a root account. And then this join token is actually what we can take across to the, um, to the worker. And I'm just gonna save this for later. And we'll finish setting up the, that master. So if you see in the guide, we were adding a new user. So let's add a user here. This could be anything. And then we want to enter that user account. Just check that we are logged in correctly. Looks good. So we can now go ahead and copy the configuration into our home directory. Now this configuration will allow kubectl to administrate the, the um, cluster. And that last line is just adding that environmental variable for kubectl into our, our login script so that as we log in and out, we can have the correct configuration ready. So let's use kubectl and we'll, we'll get the pods that are available. There aren't any running yet, so let's look in the system namespace. And we can see that the various components are actually starting up now taking slightly longer for the DNS to begin and we've now got the opportunity to apply networking. So the networking allows the various nodes to talk to each other and in this example I used Flannel, there are other network providers. So we'll apply the Flannel role-based authentication control rules and then the Flannel network driver just after that. One of the commands that we ran before was to what we call taint the master, which was allow allowing the master to run pods for us. We don't need to do that because we actually have that second box here. So I'm gonna skip that. And as I said before, you can use these commands um, instead of get pods, maybe get all, to see whether all of the services and configuration that we need has been created yet. And as far as the DNS and flannel is concerned, that's still initializing. So we can't go ahead and join this um, worker yet. Once we're ready, <coughs> we'll go over to the worker and we will use that join token and we'll connect to the other host, at which point we can do things like run this microservice so that we can test out the deployment. So I've been waiting for the Kubernetes cluster to get itself healthy up and running, and I can now see that things are ready. We have one out of one, three out of three, etc., showing that these are all running healthy services. Let's go ahead and switch over to the worker. But first of all, we'll try to see whether we have any nodes. So the only node we have is the master, which is fine. Let's switch across. So this is the command we had earlier. And this IP address of the master should be accessible within your network. So you may need to check your configuration if you have a firewall. So it looks like Cube admin normally would like us to use a DNS entry. We're actually using uh, an IP address. DNS might make more sense if you think your IP is allocated dynamically, it may change. Now we can see that um, server version has been detected and 
it's telling us to type in kubectl. Now, just like earlier, this will not work because we're not authenticated. So you can actually run kubectl on any machine that has access to the um, Kubernetes server, as long as you have those configuration files we looked at earlier. Now, it probably doesn't make sense for this slave to be able to query the cluster and to run commands. So I'm gonna switch back to the master now and let's take a look at the node list. So we can see that Mars has been up for six minutes and the slave 45 seconds. It's probably taken us less than 10 minutes in total to set up both of these machines and we now have a cluster that we can play with. So let's go ahead and deploy one of these microservices. I'm skipping ahead to run a container. So first of all, we'll look at the pods that we have running again. There are none. So this is the first example, which is going to run a GUID generator on port 9000. So I'm typing in the command and the kubectl command has now asked Kubernetes to create a deployment for us, which will then try to create a pod. So we can type in kubectl and get hold of the deployments. We see one. Same way we can now get the pods and it's actually running already, which is great. So if we were to describe that pod, we can get its IP address. And we can curl it directly. So we need port 9000 slash good. And there we go. We've set up a master and a worker. We joined the worker to the master. We've deployed a microservice and we've been able to access the pod. Now, one of the limitations we have here is that if we were to delete this pod and it got recreated, it might have a new IP address. So sometimes what we might want to do is actually expose that deployment, which means it will get a new IP address and we can access it by this service IP address, which will not change. Now, let's take a look at the services that we've got. So we see the actual Kubernetes cluster here, and then the GUIDs, and we can get hold of this microservices using that new IP address instead. And we still see that the container that served us this time was the same one as when we called the pod directly. So let's try, uh, let's try scaling that up to maybe three replicas. So if we type in kubectl scale deployment, for three replicas, we'll now have three pods created eventually. And of those three, they'll all have a separate IP address. So we've got the original IP address, which we had earlier up here, but we also have got two more. And rather than us having to remember those, we can actually use the service IP address we created earlier. And as we visit it in a kind of round robin order, you can see that the, um, the container ID is actually being reused, but it's being reused out of that pool of three different replicas. So that concludes the tutorial. The last thing that you might want to do is to go ahead and deploy the kube dashboard, at which point you can start to get a UI and rather than having to type in these lengthy commands, you can just kind of browse what you have there. So that concludes the walkthrough and now it's over to you.